Hi, I'm Lee Kelso, host of the Health Call Live Radio Hour, and I'm glad that you're here so that we can all learn more about adverse childhood events. The federal government says about 61% of us grew up with some type of a potentially traumatic occurrence in our childhood that can affect not only your mental health, but your physical health as we age. And today I want to take a special look at the role grandparents can play in helping address some of those concerns in grandchildren. And to join me to do all of that is Heather Tim. She is a licensed professional counselor who joins us from Oklahoma. Heather, thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you for having me. So let me uh, let me get very clear here on what is a, an ACE, an adverse childhood event. Can you give us a better, bigger picture on that? Definitely. So the ACE study was um, began in the mid 1990s, and it was kind of a joint venture between the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, which most people know as to be a very large health insurance uh, group. And so there was this question of why they were seeing such significant health issues um, that really just got them kind of wondering. And so the study was performed over a bit of time because there was about 17,500 participants. Um, And so they started looking at just kind of a, a wide array of things that we could potentially experience prior to the age of 18. Um, And so what they ended up coming up with was about 10 questions in total um, that would indicate whether or not you have experienced an adverse childhood experience or event prior to the age of 18. Some of them looked at, um, you know, parental physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, uh, parental uh, um, neglect, uh, both, you know, physical and emotional neglect. Um, As well as, you know, did any of your primary caregivers or parents uh, struggle with mental health, uh, substance abuse, incarceration, and domestic violence, all those things that can kind of sometimes happen within a household. And so what they came to find was that, shockingly enough, um, I want to say it was about 67% of folks endorsed at least one event having occurred prior to their 18th birthday. Um, with another additional of somewhere between one and eight, although some studies are now saying possibly as large as one in six, endorsing four or more events. And so what came out of this was understanding that the more events that somebody experienced, the more significant, not just health issues, but mental health issues can come out of it. Um, for instance, those that fell within the the one in six or the one eight and eight cat um, one in eight that experienced four or more events, oftentimes struggled with higher rates of lung cancer, heart disease, um, and actually could have as few fewer than twenty years of a normal life expectancy. Wow! So it and, actually shortens your lifespan. Um, it does. So, and I also saw in that list things like uh, feeling abandoned or having moments of or periods of food insecurity. Uh, If you are couch surfing, moving from home to home to home, you're uncertain as to um, what's tomorrow going to bring. Also, uh, feeling detached or removed from your parents, so a lack of affection. So all those things fall into that broad category of an ACE, right? That's correct. Yes. So do you see this represented in the people you talk with? I guess we should explain here that in addition to being a counselor with the state of Oklahoma, uh, you also work with an online group that uh, Mm -hmm. conducts counseling for people remotely. So do you see this uh, often? Does this come up in the backgrounds of those you counsel? It does. Um, It looks a little bit different from one place to the next. Um, You know, working for the state of Oklahoma, one of the forms that we do in the beginning of the intake process is actually give them an ACE questionnaire um, just to see kind of what all has happened prior to the age of 18. Um, And so I oftentimes use those scores to kind of help inform me as to where we're going. You know, folks that have, you know, again, a score of four or higher, I know that, okay, we're going to have some possibly some significant physical health issues. Um, But there's also going to be potentially some mental health issues in there as well. You know, if you kind of think about it, you know, if a a kiddo grows up in an environment where they see a lot of domestic violence, they're going to be experiencing a lot of stress um, in the home environment and in themselves as well. Um, which can be a great adaptability feature when we need it. <clears throat> um, kind of looking at it as, you know, if you're, you're in the woods and you see a bear, 
you're going to want your body to be flooded with stress hormones, with adrenaline, because it's going to activate your fight or flight response, which is perfect if you're in the woods and you're exposed to a bear. Not so great if you're at home and the bear just happens to come home every evening at five o'clock when they get off of work. Yeah. And so when we start yeah. seeing a lot of high scores, I start recognizing that, okay, I'm potentially looking at some significant mental health as well. Yeah, I read one study that said uh, enough traumatic exposures as a child actually reduces development of the hippocampus uh, very young in, in young children, reduces the amount of gray matter. So the prefrontal cortex area is affected. I mean, it's really pretty shocking. And we're not talking here about necessarily doesn't have to be violence that they've witnessed or been involved in. It can be just loud arguments and all of, uh, you know, the uncertainty of seeing mom and dad going at each other so much, right? Yes, um, it can be that as well. Or it could just be living in a community that doesn't feel safe. I mean, they could have a, a fantastic home environment. But if you're walking through a community where, you know, you hear a loud noise and your first thought is gunfire, you know, it, it's again, it's going to have a negative impact. Um, and a lot of times teachers will see this in their students as well. You know, a lot of kiddos showing up with ADHD-like symptoms when they don't actually meet criteria for ADHD. It's just, again, their body is constantly flooded with all that cortisol, all that stress, um, that areas of brain development are actually missing out during those times, um, which is what the brain is going to kind of do. I mean, it's going to focus more on keeping kiddos you know, alive than learning their ABCs or their multiplication tables. Uh, because at that point, multiplication is not going to help keep you alive, you know, more so than, you know, again, having those adaptability responses, which again, great, you know, in the moment, um, but will have long-term consequences if they don't get addressed. Yeah, I get that. Uh, so, you know, if, um, if you are a grandparent, uh, I think now's a good time with the holidays coming and all, we're going to be around each other a lot more. It might be a good time to take a look back at what your parenting, what you grew up with, how that affected your parenting skills, and how do I take a look at maybe I caused some harm in my own child who's now passing that on to my grandchild? Yeah, and you're right. You know, as we are getting into the holidays, you know, oftentimes that's a time of community, of, you know, getting together, families coming together. Um and so being able to, to maybe take this time, you know, as we're getting ready to creep into Thanksgiving and kind of think about, okay, what are maybe some things that I unintentionally passed over to my adult children that are in the process of maybe passing it on to my grandchildren? Um, you know, I explained to a lot of people that our parents, our primary caregivers, whether they were actually our parents or we were raised by others, um, are our first educators in this world, you know, whether they were equipped to do so or not. And so sometimes we do unintentionally pass on um, unhealthy ways of parenting um, onto the next generation. And so being able to take a moment and to, to kind of think about, you know, how did I raise my adult children to parent my grandchildren? Did I pass on some good things? Did I potentially pass on some things that I would like to see different moving forward? Um, and to be able to maybe start identifying those things and then take the opportunity to have a conversation about it. Um, you know, one of the other many things that I, I tell folks is that so often the, the things that we think are the, one, the things that we're so desperately wanting to voice. Um, and the same thing with the emotions that we feel. Often those are the things that we're really wanting other people to pick up on. And so being able to, to have those conversations, to be able to look at our adult kids and say, hey, you know, I realized that I, I parented you this way and I'm seeing you do so with your kiddo. And I'm concerned that maybe perhaps I, I gave you a, a less than helpful skill set um, and to be willing to have those conversations because without the conversations, things oftentimes don't change. OK, so guide me through one of those conversations. That's that's real interesting. Um, so if I see if I see some of myself and mistakes that I made appearing in my child and my grandchild, that's a difficult way to get the conversation started. You got any tips on that one? Yes, I do. And actually, interestingly enough, I am really big on prefacing conversations um, because they are they are hard to sometimes have. It sometimes takes a lot of courage to be able to approach that conversation. And so being able to preface it with, hey, you know, I, I'd like to talk with you. 
Um, I realized that when I was parenting you, I did X, Y, and Z. I'm seeing that you're doing that now. And I realized the mistakes that I've made. And so I would like to sit down and talk with you about this. And here's what I'm hoping to get out of the conversation is for you to better understand maybe perhaps why I thought X, Y, and Z was appropriate, what I've discovered now, because here I am as a grandparent and I've had this great, wonderful experience of being your parent and realizing the limitations that kind of came from this parenting style. And so I'd like to pass on to you maybe my wisdom um, and what maybe I'm concerned might be doing with our grand, you know, to my grandchild as well. Um, and then to ask, you know, the adult parent even what they would like to get out of their conversation, because oftentimes one conversation can lead to another one. Mm -hmm. Gives us a chance to resolve some things. Yeah. So how do I talk to a, what do I look for in a grandchild that they may be experiencing some of these adverse childhood experiences? Are there some behaviors I need to watch out for? And then we'll talk about how maybe the grandparent can intervene. Uh, yeah, so there's almost always some behaviors that can be pretty classic, some ones that, you know, really do kind of pop up. Um, you know, a, a kiddo that is very um, disconnected from their parents, kind of anxious about approaching them, keeps their distance, seems uncomfortable. I mean, that's kind of a big red flag. Most of us kind of pick up on that one. Um you know, a, a kiddo that's very perfectionistic or people pleasing, um, that becomes very, very upset when something very small happens are oftentimes indications that there's something bigger going on. Um, you know, a kiddo that's very perfectionistic or people pleasing may have learned, um, not knowing that they were learning this, but that perhaps the only time that they receive praise or, or positive experiences or comments from their caregiver is when they do things perfectly or when they please their caregiver. And so when we start seeing things like this, it, it's good to have that conversation of, you know, I, I, I noticed that little Billy or little Susie gets really upset very easily. And then they do their best to try and please people. Um, and I'm kind of curious as to what's going on. You know, have you noticed this as well? Um, and to just open up that conversation. You know, and the opposite can be true with kiddos that really distance themselves, you know, noticing that they, they keep to themselves, that they're, they're kind of more loners or they're not wanting to engage as much. Um, oftentimes those are cues that there might be something else going on just because they're not really engaging how we would expect them to see or expect to see them, you know, based off of what we've seen other kiddos. Um, and, a, you know, a lot of times you can kind of compare you know, a, a two-year-old to another group of two-year-olds, you know, is this two-year-old acting similar to another group of two-year-olds? Um, or are they, they having more tantrums perhaps, or are they just more disengaged? Um, again, just kind of looking for, for those things, you know, and kiddos do enjoy talking as well. So even as a grandparent, if you see these kind of things and you're not sure, can I go to my adult kid and ask about this? You can always talk with kiddo about it as well. Yeah. Um, so if we were to do a little role playing here, uh, Hey mom, that's just the way Bobby is. He's always been that way. I don't see a problem here. Why are you creating an issue? And that would be uh, understandable. And so a, a possible response would be, you know, my, my purpose is to not create an issue. It, it's not to, to cry, you know, to question your parenting. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, how long has Bobby been doing this and um, are other people seeing this? Like, does he only do this at home or does he do this at school as well or at daycare? Um, and to just ask for, you know, a better understanding of perhaps what's going on. And I guess it does kind of depend on what you're seeing little Bobby do. Um, you know, if little Bobby's constantly hiding from other kiddos because, you know, he he's not feeling like he can connect. Um you know, or is he possibly bullying other kiddos? You know, those can all be indications that perhaps something's going on. How so. do I, how do I, as the grandparent, how do I talk to the child about that? Do I, I guess I would start by giving them permission to tell me something's going on. You don't want to plant a thought in their head and lead them. So how, how do I have that conversation if I'm just concerned and maybe a little suspicious? Right. Um, so a, an example of that would be, and we can use little Bobby here, um, you know, to just get a hold of, uh, you know, to pull little Bobby aside. 
um, you know, in a, an environment that he feels comfortable with, you know, that could be outside while he's playing or over at the park or even over at your own home. Um, but to just ask little Bobby, you know, get down on his level and say, hey, you know, I, I wanted to talk with you and I wanted to ask if things are going OK um, and to let you know that if things aren't going OK, that it's always safe that you can tell me these things and that I won't be upset with you, you know, but that I'm really here for you. And I, I want to know what's going on in your world. Um, you know, and you can ask maybe a little bit more pointed questions, um, you know, whether or not things are going OK at home. You know, how are things going there? How are things going at school? Um, you know, just that if they, they have any um, things that they, they need to tell you or things that they're maybe afraid to tell you, because, again, you know, they might be worried that they could get in trouble. And so just reassuring them that, you know, whatever you, you say to me, you're not going to get in trouble with me. I just want to make sure that things are OK and that you're safe. You know, people in my generation um, and older grew up in a time when uh, those kind of conversations just didn't really happen very often. Um, you know, and and uh, kids weren't coddled as much as they are today. I mean, nobody in my generation grew up with a, a participation trophy. Right. Um, right. We've got to kind of open our eyes a little bit on this and um, tell me the impact that you see that this has on kids as they mature into adults. What behaviors can this enable that maybe we can get ahead of? Um, could you be a little bit more specific with that? Yeah. So what behaviors do you see in the patients that you counsel that you can tie back to these adverse childhood experiences? I'm thinking here emotionally and mentally mostly. Um, I have read that depression is often a result of this kind of experience, this repeated exposure to stress. But what other things? Um, so in, in regards to these like adverse childhood um, experiences, again, they kind of help give us the framework in which we're going to operate in the world. Um, and so if we learn at a young age that, for instance, um, our primary caregiver maybe struggles with a substance use, and so they're not always emotionally available to us or even physically available to us, um, we sometimes learn at a very young age that I can't depend on other people. And that's kind of a scary thing if we think about it, because oftentimes we do need good supports in our life. And so as a kiddo, that would make sense that I can't always depend on my primary caregiver if they're struggling with perhaps maybe a substance use issue um, and they're not always available. But I can see this also carrying over into adult relationships, um, you know, where they struggle with opening up to a romantic partner. They struggle with intimacy. They struggle with being able to feel like they can depend on the other person. Um, the same can be said for um, those that perhaps grow up in, in a, an environment that struggles with domestic violence or what's now being referred to as an intimate partner violence. Um, you know, just again, looking at those kind of dynamics and thinking, but that's what relationships look like, you know, so why would I want to open up with somebody or even possibly normalizing that and thinking that, hey, this is what all relationships are supposed to look like. Um so there's definitely a, a lot of issues that can come out of it. Um, you know, there's also the, the fear of just not being good enough again. You know, at most, most of us as children, we, we look at things that have happened in our world. Um, you know, like if we've done something and our parent responds very harshly. As a small child, we believe that the world's, world revolves around us. And we're supposed to because our next breath it revolves around our caregivers, um, our sense of safety, uh, being fed, cared for, all of those things. And so if we have a caregiver that responds very harshly to something that's very small, we're going to believe that, you know, it's because of us, because perhaps maybe we weren't good enough or, or we weren't whatever it was that we thought our caregiver needed from us. Um, and so that can make it very hard as adults to want to, to have intimate relationships, to feel safe with the idea of being vulnerable, to want to connect with others. And sometimes we do see those as also mental health issues. Um, you know, depression, anxiety, there's a lot of personality disorders that can sometimes be seen um, from folks that start talking about their, their childhood. I can see how some of those personality disorders have probably developed. 
So it, it's just, there's a huge, it, there's a huge impact to all of this, not just the physical health stuff that the CDC and Kaiser Permanente had spent so much time researching. So uh, I don't want to make um, anybody uncomfortable or paranoid about all of this. Uh, if I if I now am kind of realizing that, yeah, there was some of that in my past, or maybe I made those mistakes as, as I was parenting, um, what's the first step? I mean, are we just, you know, I've heard the phrase, seek to be understood and apologize. Does that, does that really effective? Um, so in regards to our, our own experiences, um, as maybe grandparents looking at how we parented our children and then seeing how they're parenting our grandchildren, we're always going to make mistakes. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that those mistakes are going to have um, horrible long-term consequences because there are opportunities for what's kind of referred to it as, as secondary attachments. Um, and those can actually be where our grandparents come in. Um, you know, if we're, we're perhaps seeing some of these things, you know, that gives us grandparents an opportunity to step in. Um, same thing with, you know, coaches, mentors, teachers and such. But, you know, just knowing that or just understanding that, yes, perhaps maybe we, we've had these adverse childhood experiences doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be horrible consequences attached to them. Um, because one of the things that it doesn't really assess for is what is your resiliency? Um, some people can experience these events and come out of it and be just fine. Um, although I, I imagine for many of those people that have experienced those events and have come out feeling being just fine, it's also because they've had other good um, adults in their life. Yeah. You know, other yeah. folks that have been able to step in and be able to, to mitigate maybe perhaps some of the damages that could occur. Well, and maybe that's the role that uh, that we need to be playing as grandparents is to be those folks who step in and, and be that supportive home base for that for that little one who, who may be paying the price for things that happened out of their control. Heather, we have to leave it there. I want to give people a chance, though, to learn about your blog. Uh, tell them what they'll find there and how to find it. Okay. Um, so I created a mental health blog. Um, I want to say I launched it probably about April of this year. Um, I, and I had really gotten thinking about it um, because, you know, while mental health services are becoming more available, uh, oftentimes people spend about six months really researching what's going on in their life before they want to reach out to a mental health therapist um, or even to decide whether or not they need those services. And so I had created my blog called courageousandmindful.com for the purpose of being able to give information out or get information out there to be able to help people figure out, okay, what is going on, how to start making sense out of this, um, whether or not they do actually want to link themselves with a, a therapist in their community. Um, although one of the few benefits out of COVID is that there are becoming more um, platforms that are being created for mental health services. And so that was just really what my focus was, was how can I be able to help more people um, because there's only 24 hours in a day and there's only so many hours in which I can work in a day, but how can I help people and get as much information out there as possible in a way that they would be able to find it. And so that's what the, the purpose of my blog was. And I will put links to the blog uh, along with this broadcast, along with this segment and uh... Hope that you will find it there. Heather, thanks for uh, for spending some time here, educating us on adverse childhood experiences and sharing some in tips for grandparents on how you might be able to play a helpful role. Really appreciate it. Yes, you're very welcome. I enjoyed it. <laughs>